Welcome to the FinTech Hot Seat session with Cash Force. Today we're talking about AI and big data in the context of liquidity management. I'm here with Nicholas and Mark from Cash Force. Welcome to today's FinTech Hot Seat. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks a lot. Excellent, let's get started. So Cash Force, as some of you know, does a lot with forecasting and, and other activities. Uh, but let's start with the context. We, we use the terms AI and big data. Sometimes we use those synonymously. Sometimes we're talking about those so we understand the context of how AI works. But let's just understand the terms so the rest of the session makes sense. So I'll start with you, Mark. Why don't you tell us about big data and AI? Sure, okay. Well, I'll start with the sort of the big data. Um, of course, big data means a lot of things to uh, a lot of organizations, but certainly within the context of um, corporations and forecasting, which is what the, I guess the topic of this is, we're looking at things like data quality and sources of data. So we've got you know, the concept of internal data, your ERPs, your accounting systems, um, your order management systems, your, your uh, processing systems and whatnot, and market data, and then you've got your external systems, social media, um, different types of uh, market fluctuations and things like that that go into uh, producing some metrics that organizations want to be able to look at. And I think, you know, it's interesting because the, the, the challenge, I know you and I have talked about this in previous uh, conferences here at AFP, the challenge is, is how do I work with data? You know, there's these concepts of data lakes and, and how people interact with the data lakes. But I think what we've seen certainly within, within the context of say, finance and, and, and treasury is the idea that you can break down and bridge the gap between the treasury, treasury organization, the finance department and the CFO to be able to actually use um, the data in the metrics in an analytical type way that helps drive decisions. And I think, just to men mention on that, is that the idea that uh, I think there was a, a misperception that big data means, oh, that sounds awfully expensive, that's really, really hard to do, and I'm going to need an army of data scientists, scientists to be able to work with the data. I think we've moved beyond that. I think we've gone out of that trough of disillusionment in terms of how, how applicable it is and the types of um, solutions available today in the market. Okay, just a, just a couple follow-ups on that. So you talked about data, you gave examples of a lot of data that sits within the organization. Yeah. And uh, does big data include data outside? But let me throw one more question on there. You talked about data lakes. That needs another definition because we're defining big data. Let's define data lakes too. Yeah, so I mean, you know, the way I see data lakes is, and, and I know a lot of corporations are talking about their own version of data lakes is, uh, you know, let's put in, uh, a database of data from all sorts of sources and then use BI tools to be able to go in and take relevant information out of that as a sort of a reporting layer, if you like. So like an enhanced The BI. data cubes, the, yes. uh, the the stores that are structured, have totaling, everything. Right. And you're talking about ignoring those, just going after the core data. Well, well be, being able to use uh, any applicable versions of that as well. But I, I think, with, you know, certainly some of the people I've talked to that are uh, embarking on data lake exercises, there's what's lacking behind that is the analytic components of that. So I've got data, I can put things together, I can visualize some of that, but it's just, it's, it, it's not a analyzed data in, in terms of the analytical components. So, so one other thing on big data, is it structured or unstructured? You talked yeah. about a lot of financial systems, which tends to be pretty structured. I know we've had conversations where there's data in, you know, not in rows, it's not tabular. Is that included in your concept of big data the, uh, for the purposes of this discussion? Uh, I think, as you say, uh, it's a structure, non structured We should really make the distinction between those when they're talking about data. Uh, I think for now in the industry, let's say the majority of the data being used is very much structured. Uh, there's a bit of non-structured data when we're talking about high volume businesses that, let's say, keep all sorts of trackers uh, uh, around their social media, video feeds, uh, let's say uh, clicks, you know, uh, very much from every different source. And I think it depends on the industry, depends on the specific uh, corporate you talk to, if that would be relevant or not to uh, their forecasting process in any way. So now that we've defined big data, right? Data in different locations, structured and unstructured. Let's talk about AI now. Let's, let's give the uh, short definition and then explain it so the mass is here and so I can understand it. Right. Yeah, so I mean, I, I know we chatted about AI last year, and I think that the general theme out of AFP and some of the other conferences last year was AI was going to put everybody out of a job, particularly within the treasury organizations. And um, uh, thankfully, that sort of that idea of that has somewhat dissipated a little over the last 12 months. And I think what we've been seeing um, more recently is just you know where there are applicable use cases where AI is actually lending um, you know some value 
within you know finance and within the treasury organizations and i know nicholas you can probably talk about some of the machine learning and some some more more use cases around where that's been yeah. applicable i, I think uh, as as mark you you try to hint towards is that let's say ai itself uh, it's kind of a, a term that encapsulates a lot of different other, let's say, terms underneath. Uh, it's basically just making sure that we have intelligence uh, artificially, basically yeah. intelligence not coming from a human, uh, but replaced by a machine. Now, what I think is important is that within artificial, uh, artificial intelligence, there are a couple of other, call it buzzwords, that fall underneath. And I, w I think one of them, which is very relevant to the, the case of forecasting, is machine learning. So where we say basically uh, the machine based on certain inputs will generate an output, and that output is again, let's say, uh, let's say, used as an input so that the machine in its decision-making process can actually learn over time. And, and, and that is really, I think, very interesting when you think about it, all the systems out here, basically, trying to make decisions for you. And when you just make it 1D and say, hey, do you have input and an output? The, the cool thing here is if you have an output that can be reused back as an input, the machine can further learn, uh, this is uh, this is what machine learning is about, right? Well, let, me, let me just ask you about that. So that that output and input, and so you think of forecasting, for example. And I do want to dive into forecasting examples, yeah. since that's the focus of your your corporation and much of your study. So uh, when you talk about in sample and out of sample for you know forecasting, validation, analysis, you're looking and you're trying to learn from that. So you run use historical data, and then you try to see how that works in the future. Is that a clear example of this? You know, artificial intelligence, the inputs yeah. being used to continue to improve which decision makes sense or formula? Yeah, I would say, let's say, that's one example. And I, I, I want to take it, let's say, maybe even uh, one step further. Let's say all what we do about forecasting is making sure you have, let's say, inputs derived from big data sources, right? So these big data sources have a sort of forecastable or predictional uh, value. So you create an output uh, out of that. Now, what we've recently been doing is saying, hey, because you know a forecast, you know the actuals, there is a variance. Uh, what we've done is basically said, we have a variance, so what if we basically recalculate the variance on all the past dates using your current model? So you're applying your current model onto all the different dates in the past and saying, hey, what is my variance over time? And let me give you a simple example. If we do that on, let's say, client, let's say, uh, client cash flows coming in, if you would re apply the current model to onto the past, then you're literally generating buffers because you're saying, hey, my variance on, in week one is X, my variance in week eight is a lot more. So you're creating a sort of buffer and you're recalculating the buffer for all the dates in the past and literally saying, hey, what if I re-inject that buffer to, onto my current forecast, then basically I have a, well, always, let's say, better forecast. And we've done that actually with, uh, with, with two uh, POCs where this has really proven to be more and uh, better in terms of accuracy of the forecast. So, so continue to explore the definition before the example. So sure. this example of its uh, feedback and the machine learning where you've given the machine, the system, the program parameters to continue to go back and forth with this. Is this in your mind machine learning and do you see that as a subset of AI or something different? Yeah, I, I see it as a subset of AI. Uh, and the, definitely the example here is where you basically feed your output back into the machine. And let's say the, the machine itself will kind of say, hey, I have these parameters as standard input, but I, can, I will basically learn over time that these parameters don't really fit the current state of the organization, so they will evolve over time. That, that's how I define basically uh, machine learning. Excellent, now let's, let's dive back into the example. So you gave an example. Where are we in the process today of what, what makes sense to look at? What, what are you looking at from uh, a liquidity forecast perspective? Maybe enhancing what you just described, talking about some other examples. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, when, when we were uh, talking about this before with Mark, I think one of the things that, that struck me was um, when we look at organizations today, a lot of them are still using Excel just for forecasting. So 80%, 70%, you know, somewhat in that range. So that means that a lot of people are still cleansing the data from different sources. So, you know, we want to have the, the feed on the ground. So we kind of say in terms of maturity, you're first making sure you define these are the sources that I want to use as cash, as cash forecasting sources. You're collating them together, literally. And then you're saying, well, maybe I kind of automate that process, right? Collating them together, making sure they flow into the model. And then the third step, which we just discussed, is saying, hey, maybe it's an output that I can reuse as an input. And, and let's say, let the parameters calculate itself over time. 
which I think this will evolve towards saying, hey, there are more even external data sources, going back to the big data subjects, let's say, to kind of offset the parameters even more. Because the more outputs that you can generate and, and use as to define those parameters, the better. Uh, because these parameters, let's say, they'll always have a sort of standard deviation in terms of forecasting. You can never be right. You can also always a little bit be more, more right, but never be totally right. So it's a question of making sure that you have enough let's say, inputs that can actually influence those parameters. And I think we're, we're just at the start, literally. I, that's at least my feeling. We're just at the start of, of using those input-output models to, to improve the forecasting. And um, I think another example, perhaps, with uh, customer payment behavior. So one of the things that is, of course, driving, let's say, the forecast accuracy is how well can I forecast how customers pay. And what we've seen is that if you basically say calculate an average DSO, that's the first kind of simple example of saying, hey, when would customers pay? But as we all know, DSOs are very much influenced by month-end effects, uh, by specific, let's say, invoices that were not perfect. Uh, they were offset with credit notes. So it's better to def define like the average payment behavior or calling, let's say, just payment behavior as a whole. And then you say, okay, we have a certain invoice by a certain customer, so when will that customer actually pay? What are the chances? And that's actually, um, let's say, uh, we could do it as, a, as an average, just statistically, but we could also say, hey, what is the payment behavior correlated to? So then we're really trying to add classifications to the model and say, hey, uh, my payment behavior could be based upon, the, let's say, the date of the month I have been invoicing, the amount that's on the invoice, um, who's actually taking the invoice, is it a credit collection, is it, a, let's say, an accounts payable team, or is it just a single person? So a lot of parameters that will define how we think that customers will pay. And I think that's a, a second example where we'll, we'll just at the start of saying how are our customers paying, and, and this is where we want to be of the forefront to uh, extrapolate that even further. Yeah, so and then that, uh, that further extrapolation on other influences. So when you start making projections, you might say, here's the data in our ARAP. That's pretty far along the process. So when you start to get outside of that, are you looking at or do you think there's going to be a, an influence of big data where you're saying, what outside the system influences it? Is it temperature if we sell something yeah. related to energy? <laughs> Is it uh, economic uh, activities like housing starts? Uh, changing demographics, those other areas which you may or may not know. It's one thing to say when the temperature's hot and people are out of school, they're selling more ice cream. It's exactly. another thing to say, here are some other items that may provide a lead, a leading indicator of what's going to happen to our sales, our collections, or other elements. And you can't just say, I'm going to run all my analysis there, no. but a machine can go and look at other data sets. Is that something you see as the next wave after that or the next horizon? Yeah, definitely, definitely. I think everyone wants to just improve, improve, improve the forecast. And first you're going to say, hey, these are typically the predictors that I'm going to analyze, like you say. Say, hey, temperature makes sense, so let's, let's, let's take temperature. Hey, maybe uh, sales is also dependable on geographics, on the location where I am. So you're going to pre-select the variables. And I think the next step is exactly as you say, you're going to make sure we do not pre-select the variables, you just basically throw a lot of data at it and say, hey, let the machine actually learn how to say, hey, what are now the parameters that are relevant to the discussion and not. And uh, let's say, take a, an average retailer, for example, you have the, the parameters that we actually already uh, uh, mentioned, those will be the parameters put in the model, so you'll have temperature uh, equation, uh, temperature um, uh, measurements, you have geographical measurements, you have measurements on the timing when people purchase, the, w the weather at that particular point, the wind, whatever. So all parameters you put into the model, and some of them will be, let's say, defining the forecast, and some of them will be totally not defining the forecast. That's exactly how we see it uh, going. Where are we today, right? It's great to talk about uh, you know, the future. And I remember going to an amusement park and you were sitting in those long lines and there was, in the future, packages will be digitized and transmitted as beams of light. <laughs> and I remember like, no, they won't. You know, you're not transferring physical objects. And there's, they're transferring some object up to the moon, which was seemed quite silly. But when we look about the future, when we look at the future, what's going on, uh, it's great to say this is a year away, two years away, five years away. What's happening today with machine learning and AI in the realm of cash forecasting or core treasury? What are you seeing? And Mark, maybe you could start us out. 
Well, yeah, I think I, I, Nicholas sort of alluded to, we're, we're currently in the process of doing our own POCs, working with a number of clients in this area as it relates to sort of machine learning. And uh, I guess we're, it's more around the variances and the deep learning we have with forecast learning, uh, its variance over time. And maybe you can talk in a little more on the details of that. Yeah, I think uh, as, as we mentioned during the discussion, let's say we're only at the forefront. Yeah. So I think what I, how, how I see it and how I project it is that the next year is going to be about, let's say, those input-output models. We're just making sure that we understand how the parameters can actually be, let's say, yeah, changed. But we know upfront the parameters that we'll define. And I think in about two years' time, there will be people saying, hey, we just throw data at it and make sure that the parameters will be defined, picked up from the model. And I think referring to the to the very comment that I made about, uh, let's say, everyone is still working in Excel. So it's going to be, let's say, different organizations with different maturity levels. Yeah. The ones that are still figuring out the data quality itself. And then the ones that say, hey, we have good data. Now we have a lot of data. We have the systems to run it through. So let's define, well, we have a couple of parameters in the next year. And then the, next, the year after, I really see organizations saying, hey, we'll just throw data at it and we'll let the system define what the parameters are for my better forecast. And after that, I think that's the, the level of automation linked to the forecast because we, ne we didn't talk about it here. But if you say, I have a forecast, uh, let's say, by, by currency, and you say, hey, I have a, a certain hedging policy, this is the proposed hedge, you click yes or no, depending on the risk that's involved, and you just let it flow, confirm it. You know, that's the automation part that comes then out of the forecast, which I think is an even other level of, uh, it's more automation or robotics in a way, another, let's say, piece of the uh, artificial intelligence. But, but it's a great question to ask because I think there's an over-reliance on hype uh, when people refer to AI. So we're certainly more on the on the ground trying to learn that in, in, in sort of baby steps to get there. I think, I think that's excellent. I like the example of uh, you know, forecasting and variance analysis is today. It's happening. And then there's much more in the future. And I am really looking forward to having more discussions about uh, AI, how that's being applied. Um, I, I would love to have another fintech hot seat about using big data to help with that data purity and cleansing because oh. <laughs> everyone says, oh, as soon as we get our master data record clean or we get this data, everything will be fine. <laughs> and there's this recursive process, you know, the Sisyphusian pushing the rock up the hill, it keeps rolling Absolutely. down. And there are ways to use big data to do that, but that's the topic for another fintech hot seat. I want to thank Nicholas. these two guys, Nicholas. <laughs> Mark. I want to thank, I'm sorry I had to rename him, Nicholas and Mark for uh, joining me on this FinTech Hot Seat. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Cheers. Thanks.